Well, good day to everybody. Welcome to another Daily Devotions. It is October 8th, and today we look at three chapters in Matthew's Gospel, chapters 15, 16, and 17. Man, what a lot of material. So uh, we can't hit all of it, but we'll try and hit the high points, try and put some of this stuff in context for you. So chapter 15 starts out with a debate between the Pharisees and the scribes. Um, and um, one of the things I need to do here at some point is tell you about the different groups, Pharisees, Sadducees, Essenes. Um, gosh, uh, I, I guess I can, wait, what should I do? Should I just do a separate video, like a like an appendix? Uh, or should I, uh, let me ponder that. Okay, so I'm thinking out loud. All right. So the Pharisees and the scribes come to Jesus, and they want to know why he's breaking the traditions of the elders. Now, what are the traditions of the elders? First of all, the word tradition in the Greek is paradosis, and it simply means to hand over or to hand down. Tradition is that which we hand down. So like all families have traditions, you may have holiday traditions at Christmas or Thanksgiving, things that you do that you that maybe your grand your parents did before you and now your children if they're grown are doing the same thing that's a tradition so the tradition is wisdom that is passed down now some tradition is very wise and it's good that we continue to follow it some traditions see their day maybe we're good at one point but then it's time to let go of it and other traditions probably weren't good in the first place right so we have to make judgments about the traditions that we have inherited, we have received, plus the traditions that we get to pass along. So what are the traditions of the elders here? So you've got the law, all right, a little bit of quick history, then we'll go back to the Old Testament. Uh, One of the great problems for the people of Israel was their inability to keep the law of Moses. Uh, Their, or I shouldn't say inability, I should, should say lack of desire to keep the law of Moses. And it is, the breaking of the covenant that is the reason the prophets continue to say as to why Israel goes into exile in Babylon, while the northern kingdom gets dragged off into uh, oblivion, historical oblivion by the Assyrians, the southern kingdom uh, gets taken into Babylonian exile, and then they return from exile. So when they get back from exile, one of the things that uh, the leaders of God's people want to make sure is that they don't uh, go breaking the law again, right? Uh, They don't go getting in trouble again, which led them into exile in the first place. They wanna make sure they keep the law. Well, what's the best way to keep the law? Well, the best way to keep the law is to make even stricter laws so that if you don't break the stricter laws, you don't break the law at all. So you put a fence around the law or you put a hedge around the law. So an example would be, The speed limit is 55 miles an hour and you're on the freeway. And just to make sure that you don't break that speed limit, you drive 50. Some people do that, most of us don't. But that's what it means to sort of put a hedge around the law. You you make something, you, you observe something, you draw the boundary closer so that you don't step over the real boundary of actually breaking the law. What happens over time by Jesus's day is that fence becomes viewed as the law itself. So if you if you step over that fence, you are breaking the law. Now what Jesus is doing is he is stepping on that fence, but he gets accused of breaking the law. Nah, not really. He's not really breaking the law. He's just stepping on their fence. And so he's getting accused of breaking the traditions of the elders. Um, uh, God says, honor your father and mother. Um, Jesus uses a response. So, so here's an example. Here's an example of what Jesus uses. The 10 commandments, one of the 10 commandments is honor your father and mother. Now this is actually in its context, as we saw back there in Deuteronomy and Exodus is that this is a command to adult children to honor and take care of their parents in their old age. This is not about seven-year-olds honoring their parents, though they should do that, of course. It's about the responsibility that adult children have toward their elderly parents. Jesus uses this as as an example of how 
the tradition of the elders actually leads, doesn't protect, doesn't necessarily protect from breaking the law, but leads to breaking the law. So in verse four, Jesus said, for God said, honor your father and mother, and whoever speaks evil of father or mother must surely die. But you say that whoever tells father and mother, whatever support you might have had for me is given to God, then that person need not honor, honor the father. So in other words, the religious leaders had come up with this way to get more money for the temple, get more money for uh, their religious projects by setting up uh, what will be called Corbin. And it is a way to uh, offer what you own to the temple and uh, as a gift. And if you do that, then you, you need not, uh, then that's, that's what you're taking away from taking care of your elderly parents. So Jesus says, it, the commandment says, honor your father and mother, but you've created a, a situation where adult children don't have to honor their parents. They can actually take the resources that they have. And instead of taking care of their parents, they can say, I'm going to dedicate this to the temple. I'm going to offer this to the temple. And Jesus says, and then when you do that, guess what you do? You nullify the commandment. You nullify the commandment to honor your father and your mother. Uh, and he says, so for the sake of your tradition, you make void the word of God. All right. So sometimes we draw stricter boundaries because we want to protect something, but sometimes in so doing, we actually undermine something. Um, and so this is what Jesus calls them out. And then he gets into, this is the one place. And I said at the beginning of our series in Matthew, that the issue of the law is complicated. Now that Christ has come, what do we keep? Do, is all the law taken care of? Is all the law no longer in force? Is some of it? It's, it's a complicated. It's, it's not just easy to, to sort through, and we'll get more into that in Paul. But what Jesus does seem to do here in verse 10 um, is uh, that uh, he, uh, he declares uh, he declares foods that have been traditionally unclean, not kosher for Jews, he declares them clean. Um, so he says, it's not what goes, uh, uh, it is not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person, but it's what comes out of the mouth. Um, and of course, the Pharisees took offense, we're told, and uh, um, he, uh, Jesus has some criticism for them, but then he goes on and says, um, in verse 17, do you not see that whatever goes into the mouth enters the stomach and goes into the sewer, but what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart, and that is what defiles. For out of the heart comes evil intentions, murder, adultery, fornication, theft, false witness, slander. These are what defile a person, but to eat with unwashed hands does not defile. So so the issue here is unwashed hands, and I, I think I mentioned that before, where the, the unwashed hands here, it's not, it's not an issue of not cleaning your hands. Uh, for hygienic reasons. There's a ritual of hand washing that the Pharisees are not, or that the disciples are not following. And Jesus says that that's not what defiles. He's going to make this same point. Um, we're going to see um, in, in a late, later on in Matthew, I think, if not Matthew, it'll be Mark or Luke, where he'll use the same thing to declare foods clean. And so that'll be the one thing that uh, we know that Jesus said is no longer necessary, uh, keeping, the, keeping the dietary kosher laws. Um, now, by the way, that doesn't mean that faithful Jewish Christians can no longer keep kosher laws. They may do so because it's out of their heritage, because it's what they've always done. They've never eaten pork, so they're not going to eat pork. What will be a problem for Paul when we get to it is that he doesn't have a problem if Jewish Christians still want to keep these laws for the sake of their own uh, conscience, or it was just the way they have have always been. He, he's going to he, but he, what he's what he's going to impose is forcing that on the Gentiles. Okay, we'll get to that. We get also uh, the faith of the Canaanite woman, and this is where we see that Jesus is called primarily to give the good news to God's people, Israel first. Uh, the gospel is universal. And it will be universal, certainly uh, after Jesus and the day of Pentecost comes, the gospel will now start to move out to all the nations. 
But in Jesus's ministry, it's Israel that gets the right to hear first. But you do get the story of the Canaanite woman um, who uh, who wants uh, a, her daughter to have a demon cast out of her. And um, Jesus, uh, Jesus says, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Um, but um, uh, she persists. And um, she answers him, interestingly enough, she says, it's not fair to take, Jesus answers and says, it's not fair to take the children's food and throw it to dogs. She said, yes, Lord, yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. So when Jesus says this, dog, the, the dog was a, a, a comparison to the Gentiles. Now, remember, dogs are domesticated by Jesus's day, but there's also a lot of wild dogs running around. And, and uh, so Jesus employs this uh what would have been a jewish insult of gentiles uh to say look you you feed the kids first right the children of israel you don't feed the dog and she says i'm not looking i'm not looking to cut in line i'm not looking to take anyone's place i just want a little bit of something for my daughter and um jesus says, jesus hears that and responds your faith is great and let it be done as you wish and her daughter was healed instantly. So here we have a glimpse of the gospel going to the Gentiles that I, I said earlier uh, a few sessions ago that the miracles are glimpses of the kingdom that has come. They're the previews of a time when there'll be no more pain, crying, sickness, and death. And we even see now here a preview of this kind of healing of the gospel coming even to the Gentiles. Now you get the feeding of the 4,000 uh, as Post to the 5,000, and uh, uh, you have uh, that story as well. In chapter 16, you get a demand for a sign. The Pharisees and Sadducees want a sign, and uh, Jesus says, uh, you know, when it's evening, you say, it'll be fair weather, the sky is red, and in the morning, it'll be stormy today, for the sky is red and threatening. You know how to interpret the appearance of the sky, but you cannot interpret the signs of the time. An evil and adulterous generation asked for a sign, but no sign will be given to it except the sign of Jonah. Then he left them and went away. Now, it's interesting. First of all, they come, the religious leaders come asking for a sign. Well, they've seen signs. They've witnessed signs. They've witnessed Jesus healing. Uh, they've witnessed this kingdom teaching that everyone is astounded by. So they're seeing signs, but, but that's not, they don't really want to see signs. They want to see something that they can accuse him of or something that they can say to the crowds. You see, he's not really the deliverer. He's not really the Messiah. So they're not answered for that. So when Jesus turns it back on them and say, you know what? You, you, you can see signs in the weather, but you can't see you, you, the educated people, you who know the scriptures, you can't see the signs when it's staring you right in the face. So you're not going to get any sign. And even if you did, you wouldn't believe. And the only sign is the sign of Jonah, meaning as Jonah, Jesus will say elsewhere, as Jonah was in the belly of the whale for three days and three nights, so the son of man will be in the belly of the earth. So it'll be death, Jesus's death, and then his resurrection. That will be the ultimate sign that Jesus is uh, God's Messiah, the one that God has sent into the world. You also begin in Matthew's gospel uh, on this, as, as tensions between the religious leaders and Jesus heat up, you begin to see the disciples struggling more with trying to make sense of Jesus' ministry. So um, we get in chapter 16, starting with verse 13, at Caesarea Philippi, Matthew, Mark, and Luke all have this story. And uh, Jesus says to the disciples, or he asks them, who do people say the son of man is. In other words, Jesus is saying, what's the rumors out there? What's the scuttle? But yes, the, the first century had the rumor mill just like we do today. They just couldn't spread it as fast because they didn't have Facebook. And so uh, what, are, what are some saying? Well, you know, some saying you're John the Baptist come back from the dead and others Elijah or Jeremiah, one of the prophets. Uh, that's what's going, people are saying. And uh, but then he asked the disciples the question that all of us must answer. Who do you say that I am? All of us must answer that question. Who do we say Jesus is? Simon Peter steps up. You're the Messiah and the you know, son of the living God. And Jesus offers a blessing to him. 
Uh, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. And you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Now, Peter, Petros, is rock. Peter's name is Simon. We know that. He gives him, Jesus gives him the nickname Peter. He gives, Jesus, we, we do see, we do see if we're looking, that Jesus had a sense of humor because after James and John want to call down fire of judgment on a Samaritan town for rejecting Jesus, he starts calling them sons of thunder. A uh, little bit of wry humor there. He calls Peter, he calls Simon, he gives him a nickname, Rocky. He's Rocky, perhaps because we don't know, but maybe it had something about Peter's stature. Maybe he was a big guy. Maybe he was, you know, built big and built, you know, and so he's Rocky. Um, and but he uses the play on word and he says, you are Peter, you are a rock. And on this slab of stone, it's a big slab. It's not just a rock. It's a slab of stone. I will build my church. So obviously Catholics and Protestants have a disagreement about how to interpret this. Catholics believe that Peter, that Peter is the one on whom the church is built. Um, and, and so Peter's the first Pope, according to Catholic theology and history, whereas Protestants have tended to say, no, the rock uh, that Jesus is building the church on is not Peter, but the confession of faith that Peter made. You are the Christ, the son of the living God. So we Protestants have said that big slab of earth, Peter is, is the rock who confesses, but it's on that, it's on that confession, which is the big slab of earth that uh, Christ will build his church. And I happen to follow that interpretation. All right. And so right after this, though, so, so Peter has declared Jesus the Messiah. Jesus now tells them what that means. Verse 21, from that time on, notice that. From the time on of, of Peter's confession, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and undergo great suffering at the hands of the elders, chief priests, scribes, and be killed, and on the third day be raised. But Peter, the guy who just confessed, said, uh, no, Lord, this ain't the way it's going to happen to you. Stick with me. Let me give you some Messiah lessons. Uh, the Messiah in Peter's world doesn't die. Messiah in Peter's world conquers the Romans and brings in the kingdom through the sword. And so here is Jesus the very next minute here first praises him for his confession of faith and then <laughs> responds to Peter uh, when Peter chastises him. Get behind me, Satan. Get behind me. You are stumbling block to me for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. So, man, talk about going from being favorite pupil to having to sit in the corner with the dunce cap on, right? But Peter, like the rest of the disciples, have to learn what, how Jesus is the Messiah and what he will do. And they'll, they'll figure that out with the help of the Holy Spirit, but it's going to take some time. Uh, and so then Jesus, again, continues to teach that what salvation is about is denial and sacrifice uh, and giving up. Uh, it's not ambition, it's not power, it's not uh, pushing your way through, it's actually uh, being humble and submitting to oneself. And then he has this interesting verse at the end of uh, uh, the end of 16, 28, truly I tell you there are some standing here who will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. So what is that? Is that the cross and resurrection? Is that his ascension? Is that the second coming? What is it? Well, I tend to think that here it's a reference to the transfiguration when he says, some of you will not taste death. Uh, because all the disciples, except for Judas, were all alive when Jesus uh, was crucified and raised. But the only people he takes with him on the Mount of Transfiguration are Peter, James, and John. So they get to see a glimpse of his glorification before his resurrection. So he takes them up to the mountain. The mountain is an important place in the Bible. As we see people meet God on the mountain. Moses meets God on the mountain. Elijah meets God on the mountain. And so they, they go up there and he is transfigured. His face shone like the sun and his clothes were dazzling white. Another gospel writer will say such as that they could not be bleached. Boy, this would be a great commercial for bleach, right? Wouldn't it? Um, and then we've got two figures from the past coming. Moses and Elijah are talking with him. Um, we're not told what they're talking about. 
Luke will tell us. Nah, we got to get there. All right. Um, but he's talking with Moses and Elijah. So my first question is, how do they know it's Moses and Elijah? You know, they have little name tags. Hello, my name is Moses, right? Hello, my name is Elijah. Um, you know, did, did they see it? Did they recognize their faces from the Sunday school curriculum? That kind of thing. Um, I think probably this is afterwards, Jesus having conversation with them and telling them who this is and what's going on. So the story, remember the story is told after the event. Why Moses and Elijah? Well, Moses is the lawgiver. Um, and he is considered the quintessential lawgiver. He's also a prophet. He's called a prophet, but he's a lawgiver. And Elijah is considered the quintessential prophet. He is the prophet of prophets. Um, and he, of course, has a role in the coming of the Messiah, right? John the Baptist. And so I think Moses and Elijah represent the law and the prophets. And that in some way, this is a way to say, Jesus is fulfilling uh, what the scriptures have said about him. And so good old Peter, and I love Peter because Peter says what he's thinking. You know, sometimes we, we kind of roll our eyes at some of the things Peter says. But, you know, the disciples are thinking this stuff, too. They just don't have the courage to say it. Peter's got some courage to at least say it. And I, I can appreciate that. But he says, well, it's great to be up here. Let's just stay here. Let's camp out build some tents and just enjoy the moment. It's a kumbaya moment. You know, it's like you go into church camp. When I was a teenager going to church camp and you had such a great week and it was so difficult to leave. We're having a kumbaya moment. Let's stay here. But they can't do it, of course. Um, and then you get this cloud again, Old Testament imagery for the presence of God. Uh, and you get, this is my son, the beloved with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. This is the language of the Old Testament for God's people, Israel, my son, my beloved. And now it refers to Jesus, who is the representative, who is the one who is going to be the light to the world and sh show the light of God's salvation to everyone, which was Israel's job, which they failed to do. But Jesus as the representative of God's people, will be the light of the world and will be a light to the nations. Um, so they're coming down the mountain. And uh, again, Mo, uh, Jesus wants to, wants to give them some instruction on why Elijah's got to come first and the suffering of the Son of Man. But when they get to the bottom of the mountain, there is a boy uh, who has a demon. And... Um, uh, and we're told he has a demon, but we're also told he's epileptic. Hmm, interesting. Um, and um, so, you know, I, I look, folks, I do believe that there are principalities and powers. I think because Jesus believed that Jesus believed that there was a devil. Jesus believed in demons. And so I do as well. But I also think we need to be careful about seeing demons under every rock. So is this really a demon or is this? A boy who has a medical condition that's being uh, uh, seen in that way as demonic. Okay, well, we don't have time to deal with that, but uh, we can ponder it, though. Um, and, of course, Jesus rebukes the demon, we're told, so must be a demon who maybe sends the boy into epileptic fits. Could be. But here's the thing. Um, the disciples waiting at the bottom of the mountain couldn't cure it couldn't cure this young man and jesus of course is impatient he's impatient and and uh so this is why peter this is why we can't follow they couldn't follow peter's advice to stay up on the mountain kumbaya because you got to get down into the world and be god's people in mission to offer healing to the world and this is what the church still does today we can't just stay in our stained glass sanctuaries. It's great. We can gather there and worship and all that, but we can't stay there. We have to get out into the world because Jesus has come to offer salvation and healing from our brokenness. We are bearers of that message. So we can't stay on the mountaintop. We got to get down. We've got to be out and about uh, living and embodying and pointing to the, the healing of the good news of Jesus for everybody. Um, so, uh, Jesus again foretells his death and resurrection. He's not going to stop harping on that until after his death and resurrection. And then finally, one other thing, um, 
want to know why the teacher does not pay the temple tax. Well, but he said he does pay the temple tax. And um, so they're asking about, Jesus is asking Simon, you know, where do kings of the earth take their toll of tribute from children, from others, from others. Um, so uh, uh, this is an interesting little story because this is where uh, he's, he tells Peter, go catch fish, the, catch fish. The first fish you find will have a coin in it and uh, take that coin and pay the temple tax. It's a strange story. We're not sure exactly uh, what to do with this. And in fact, uh, uh, when you look at most commentators, they, you know, they scratch their head over this and what's going on. So I'm going to scratch my head and say, I'm not quite sure what's going on here either. All right, friends, that's it for today. Let's pray. Gracious God, thank you for the gift of this day. Thank you for the great privilege of being people called into the brokenness of the world. Yes, we're broken and you are restoring us too, but we have the message of your work as Jesus was a light to the nations. Help us to shine the light of Jesus to those around us. In his name we pray, amen. All right, friends, hasta mañana.